Hey there, I'm Mark, and I'm in my truck. This is Jason. We're gonna go ahead and do some questions and answers. Question one, yeah. I'm a college student. Mm -hmm. What do I need to learn besides what they're teaching me in school? This is specific to a, a marketing degree. Right now it's a really popular belief to hate schooling, right? Like people are down on post-secondary education. And I can understand why. Schools really, really struggle to be able to stay up to date with how fast things are changing. Um, a lot of times they're doing kind of foundational information that isn't the latest breaking, you know, their teachers are kind of out of the fields. Uh, but if you need to go to school for anything that requires uh, academia, if you want answers, you can't replace schooling. Right? If you want to be a doctor, if you want to be a lawyer, if you want to be a, an engineer, if you want to do that kind of stuff, you cannot replace schooling. But if you're going to school for marketing, uh, I consider marketing a trade, the way that I consider it for an electrician or a plumber or anything else. And this is a trade where when you go to school, you're going to learn the foundations, but nothing will replace the real world. Nothing will replace being in the field and learning under some masters and getting your hands dirty and having someone show you what to do and making mistakes. Nothing will replace that. And so in school, you're gonna get those foundations, but what you won't be taught is how to actually do anything. If you wanna get into brand strategy, the only way to do that is to sit down and start working through a brand strategy. You can, you can read it in the textbooks, but you're not gonna go very far. You know, we went, I went to film school, you went to film school? Yeah. So we went to film school. You can read about how to operate a camera and how to get framing, and you can read about composition and editing, but eventually you're gonna to have to sit down and pick up a camera. Eventually you're gonna actually have to play with framing. The best way to get good at this craft is to learn. And so the, I think the real heart of the question is where do you start? Like what do you start with? You can do anything you want. And I think you need to start with your obsession. What are you obsessed with? You know, early on in my career, I got really obsessed with segmentation and audiences. And that has carried me really, really far because so much of what I do from a strategy point of view is just understanding who is the audience, what do they care about? I, I love, um, the psychology of buying. I love uh, understanding the differences between someone of a certain age and someone of another age. Like I was not really gonna learn that in school, but getting obsessed with it and digging into it and going to YouTube and listening to podcasts and, and, and just, just getting really deep into it is the best way to become uh, not an expert at something, but the best way to be able to own what it is you do and how you do it. So what they will not teach you at school is the real specifics. They'll teach you the generals. And the only way to get really deep into the specifics is to decide what it is that you are obsessed with. Okay, next question. Job offers, which one would you choose? I'll be graduating come end of May and I have two job offers. One is a digital specialist role at a company who's done really well in traditional marketing um, and wants to invest in digital now. And the other is a digital, digital agency that only focuses on digital. Uh, I don't think anyone can answer this question for you. I, I would go with what my heart says. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't rationalize it. I wouldn't overthink it. I would say, you know, which one feels right to me. You know, if you want to go into the digital role at the larger agency, um, that's fine. The, the truth is, you're not going to be at this place forever. So, if you're graduating, I would look at the place that gives me the greatest amount of learning in the shortest amount of time, the exposure to the most things possible, uh, a really great group of people. I would try and get a sense if they can mentor me if I can make mistakes there. Is this like, you know, when I graduated from school, I had a job where I made a ton of mistakes and it was awesome because I was able to hide them all. No one knew I was making the mistakes. I wasn't failing in front of everyone. So, you know, ultimately you're gonna move around, especially if you're in the agency world, uh, unless you're starting your own thing. But I would look at which uh, organization gives me the foundation that I need, has the coolest people where I can learn, where I can make mistakes, where I can be exposed to different things. And that's how I'd make my decision but no one's gonna make this decision for you. Just trust your gut. What's your go-to marketing plan template? Your go-to marketing plan template? Yes. Here, here's what I would say. Everybody focuses on tactics and activities. Everyone says, I need to do X, so I have to do Y, right? I need more sales, so I have to advertise, right? We think about tactics. A marketing plan is the foundation for tactics. So rather than focus on tactics, rather than focus on activities, you need to back things up. Here are the questions that you can template, but you can't have a template marketing plan. What are the objectives? What are the challenges you're facing? 
who is the brand? What is the brand? What is the tone? What is the voice? Who is the target audience? What their motivations are? Why would they buy from you? Why would they believe in you? How much do they know about you? What are their preconceived notions? Then once you understand what your challenges are, your objectives are, who it is you're speaking to, their pre preconceived notions, what do you have to say, how much do they trust you, where do these people exist, you know, do you have an awareness challenge, a conversion challenge? Once you understand all of these things, then you can go to your marketing plan template and cherry pick the activities that work best. So our marketing plan template, if you want to call it, our wish list has like 150 possible activities, but we're typically only going to do four, five, six, seven of them. Now, the ones that we choose to do is 100% dependent on what the customer's challenge is, on what your challenge is. So don't think about te templating out your plan. Think about templating out the types of questions you ask and then go ahead and pursue those answers. What steps should a marketing student take to be a step ahead of their peers before graduating? You were much more recently a student than I was. Yeah. What do you think of that? I think it comes down to taking the advice that you gave earlier and that is any real world application you get um, while you're in school will put you that much further ahead of everyone who's just learning the theory in school. There you go. Don't focus on just the theory, you can start actually doing it. Career advice, stick with a big company or venture into a small business? Again, this is a decision that you have to personally make. When you work in a large organization, the main pros are you have uh, upward momentum, so you have the ability to move up in your role and your career, and you know you have maybe access to more money, better compensation, uh, more respect of hours. You know, when you work in a large organization, a lot of them, when you say I'm on vacation, you just you take your vacation. It's not like the company falls apart. It's not like there's the pressure on you for the weeks leading up to it and the weeks afterwards to make stuff up. You know, like there are a lot of benefits to working in a large organization. If you are specifically in marketing or in sales and you want to just do your job and do it really well and then move up within your career path, there's nothing better than being in a large organization. Now, the small company though, you know, you're not just a number. The stuff that you do day to day really can help shape and direct the company. Uh, you may be an army or a department of one, in which case it's all on your shoulders. So, so there's that pressure, but then there's exposure to more things. You know, like you may be responsible for many, many more things, and you must, you might like the exposure to a whole bunch of different roles, responsibilities, and attacking things in different ways. So, I think it really depends on where you are in your career and what it is that you're looking for. If you've been in a small company or an agency for a really long time, there's a lot of benefits to being in a big company. Because you know you love the stability, you you love uh, maybe the higher compensation, you love the fact that you can focus on one thing, but maybe you have a lot more politics. Right? If you worked in a large organization for a long time, people love getting in small companies because they finally feel like they're not just a number. They feel like uh, they're not just managing up all the time. That they can have a real impact on the organization, the company, and the work. You have to decide what's right for you. I'm afraid of starting up my own business because if it fails, I'll be stuck in a job I hate. Okay, so I guess I would start with where are you right now? If you hate your job right now, then it doesn't really matter because you're stuck in your job right now. Uh, if you love your job right now, then I would question why you're thinking about starting your own business. Like, What are the motivations? What are the drivers behind it? So let's just assume that you're doing something right now that you're not that happy with. You know, like a lot of people are stuck in jobs, but they're not really. I have a friend who uh, is doing very, very well in his career and admitted to me that you know he really wished he always wanted to become a cop. He always wanted to be a police officer. And he even went through the training, the police foundations, and even went through the testing. And he's like perfect for being a cop because he's, you know, in his, in his 30s, level-headed, um, a, a visible minority, has a great perspective uh, on, on the community that he's a part of. Like he is, he is everything that I think the police department would be looking for in a cop. And so the other day I said, like, where are you with this? Like, what's going on? And he's like, well, you know, I have a mortgage. And kids, thinking about sending my kids to private school, right? My, my wife, you know, she's just getting back into the career, into the job, this and that. I was like, dude, like, would you rather take a two or three year hit on your salary and eat ramen noodles and scrape to get by to know that you can spend the next 20, 25 years being a police officer, which is the thing that you feel you were called to do? Or do you want to stay in IT and regret it for the rest of your life? Like literally regret that you didn't take the two or three year hit on your salary, your income, or whatever it is to make this happen, right? 
that, like, he's not going to lose his house over this. He's just going to set himself back a little bit to do the thing that he loves. So if you're stuck in a job right now and you're thinking about starting your own business, are you going to take the hit that you need to take to do the thing that you want to do for the rest of your life? Or are you going to just go ahead and be like my friend and regret this forever? Because the worst thing that can happen is that, yeah, you do it, you fail, you lose some money, but even then you're not stuck in a job for the rest of your life. Like the punishment of failing in business is not a 25 year life sentence in a job that you hate, right? Yeah. It's like you take a hit for a few years, you pay off your debt or whatever, you work through bankruptcy or you, you, know, you rebound your, from your ego from the failure that you've had or whatever it is. But, but, but the risk of failing is not going to jail. Right, Oscar? Yeah, you know how people can feel like that. If you were like super happy at your job and you're thinking of taking a risk and you might lose that great job you have, that's something to think about. But if you're already paid where you are. Sure, but okay. But let's say that you, let's say that you love your, where you are right now and you're still thinking about this. I think most people who make changes, it comes out of a place of lack of contentment, right? Like I don't think anyone who's like really, really happy and super content really does anything i think i think you i think you're happy you're content like there's no reason to push right so i also think that a lot of people think that it has to be one or the other yes and sometimes you can do both yes you can work on your business very slowly little by little Mm -hmm. and almost like monkey branch from your secure job to your thing of course Uh, you don't have to just wake up one day throw everything out the window just to like yeah. Maybe there's a, yeah, you just have to put more work, more hours, less sleep. Let's say you're in a job that you absolutely love and you're still thinking about doing your own thing. The only thing that comes down to is regret, right? Are you going to regret not having taken the chance? That's it. You don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but I thought of this for you. Good preface. So Gary Vee, I was listening to Gary Vee, I thought of you, he said um, the reason that he can scale so quickly is that he has no ego in making the wrong hires. He hires quickly and he fires quickly. Okay. What do you think the downside to hiring quickly and firing quickly is? Do you agree with his upside and that it allows him to scale quickly? I don't know, I don't hire quick and fire quick. You don't really know whether someone's a good hire or not until you start working with them. That's mm-hmm. ultimately it. And so the faster that you can bring in someone, the faster you can work with them, the faster they can show you what they can do and then you can determine if they're actually a really good fit or not. And you can shape them, you can grow them in their role, you can grow them as a person and you can do amazing things together. The other thing I've learned is like some people who come in, uh, turn it around. Some people who come in do amazing things and they grow into the role and they just need a little bit more time. But what I have kind of learned is to trust my gut when the writing's on the wall when the red flags are waving there's no there's no overcoming it like you are better off just to let the person go how do you communicate or instill your mentality with your team so i think this question really just comes down to culture and more than anything you have to be able to decide who you are and what you stand for and the type of people that you want in your organization representing you so if you hire people who align with your working style, your philosophy, your approach, your outlook, essentially your culture, then you don't have to actually spend that much time communicating it because you all live it. Everyone on the team lives it. And then the day-to-day communication is through action. You know, uh, it's through it's through the interactions, it's through like little tiny corrections or little tiny changes. It's not through these big, massive, like let me sit down now and indoctrinate you into the way I think and how things work. How much value is a single employee worth? Oh, that's a huge question. That's massive. So I I think it really depends. When you are employee number one in the role, and that employee is opening up a whole new division of things that you're offering, then that employee is massively important. So let's say that you run uh, like a plumbing company, and you bring on an employee who's an electrician, suddenly your entire company can now do plumbing and electrical. It is now a licensed plumber and a licensed electrician. How important, how valuable to the company is that person, right? If you're a dentist and you're gonna bring on an employee or a partner or something who's an orthodontist, how valuable is that person to you? If you're a dentist and you're gonna bring on your 10th or 15th orthodontist, then they're only as valuable as they are like in the unique things that they drive. So that's the issue. Earlier we were talking about big company, small company being a number or not being a number. From an operational point of view, when you bring something that the company cannot have without you, 
then you are so valuable to the company they can't afford to lose you. When you bring in something that ultimately drives value and you're great at your job, but but frankly is replaceable, or you can find it you know, in a slightly different flavor, a slightly different style from someone else, then you know, I don't want to say you're unimportant. You're important. Everybody is important in a company, but it starts to change from like life-changing importance to not. If you go on vacation and no one notices and the company just runs along fine, you're not that important. You know, people worry about when they grow their company, hey, how can I do something I've never done before? I don't have the knowledge or understanding. You hire someone with that knowledge and understanding and just like that, overnight, your company now has that. Yeah. All right? I don't have a background in data and analytics and insight. But when I hire Michael in my agency and he has 20 years of experience doing this and this is what he does all day every day, suddenly my company has analytics insight and the ability to manage data. Overnight, when I hire him. We didn't have it on Monday, we suddenly have it on Tuesday. That person in that role is very, very important and it's a high risk role if I lose that person if they're not replaceable. I like to build companies around people individuals, people who bring like a really unique asset and a really unique skill set. And if I lost that person, every person that I lose hurts us to a certain degree because we're not going to find someone who's exactly like that. Now, I do have the confidence that we're going to find someone who can still fulfill the skill sets and the role. They're going to bring, I've done this long enough to know that everybody brings their own kind of magic formula to something. So I'm not worried about, about losing that person because I will hire someone else who will fill that role, who will bring a different magic formula to it. I want to know which questions you liked the most, what you agreed with, and what you disagreed with. Remember, if you have a question for me, you can email me questions at markdrager.com. And like always, you got to think big, you got to be bold, you got to say yes. How do Hold I engage? I got to do intros and stuff. All right, we're rolling. Do you remember how this works? Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> question one. You got questions, I got answers. <laughs> okay, question one. If growing and scaling your business by being better at sales and better at marketing, better at customer experience is important to you, be sure to check out this video right over here. And like always, subscribe to my channel, click on the bell icon, and get each video every day when it drops.